I'm Mark Roach, and this is Future Wise Energy, December 5th. And the market just handed us a gift wrapped in contradictions, oil and gas rigs diverging like old friends taking different exits on the highway. That split is worth unpacking because it tells you something the headlines miss entirely. WTI is sitting at 59.70 per barrel, Brent at 63.26. You'd think that's bad news for crude producers. You'd mostly be right. But what separates the investors making money from the ones watching the, their portfolio bleed is understanding what those prices actually mean. The year-over-year -year decline of 11.2% isn't random. It's a sentence being written by oversupply on one page and weakening Chinese demand on the other. Now flip to natural gas. Henry Hub just hit $5, almost $5.10 per million BTU. That's a 50% surge in 12 months. Not bad for what was being written off as a commodity in collapse mode just about 18 months ago. Impact of the administration policies having a, a major effect on the market. The culprit isn't mysterious. Now, LNG export terminals are sucking feed gas at near record rates, averaging 18 to 19 billion cubic feet per day. Cold weather forecasts are tightening winter supplies, and here's the plot twist nobody wants to admit out loud. Data centers are changing the demand curve in ways traditional forecasts never saw coming. The drilling picture shows operators having, have, have done the math. Oil rigs dropped to 407, down 72 to two rigs year over year. Gas rigs climbed up to 125, 23 up from last year. The Permian rig count sits at 251. That's down 300 plus from a year ago. But crude production hasn't, hasn't budged. Still running around 13.6 to 13.8 million barrels per day. How does that happen? Well, they're drilling wells and not completing them. And then over time, they're bringing completion crews in so that frack spreads, you know, are just recently hit a low of uh, 178 active crews. But the ones that are running are squeezing more oil out of fewer wells. That means we're getting better at completing the wells that have been drilled maybe even a year or two ago. And we're bringing them online, and that's what's flattening production, even though the rig count's fallen in, in the Permian. So this is a different world than we thought possible five years ago. We've never seen this before. This is where ExxonMobil's, also where ExxonMobil's petroleum coke play gets interesting. You've heard me talk about this, and some of the other um, pundits have, have um, opined on on. This Exxon uh, event, which leverages their their power, their diversity, you know, from being a refiner and a producer. So they're using a, a refinery byproduct. If you didn't listen in on my earlier video, and they're processing that refinery product from oil into a lighter propent. It's basically just something that was almost a a waste product in, in the way some people might view it. And they're, they're making a lighter propent that's used to frack. And it, they've designed it so that it can travel deeper into these fractures that they're creating in their wells in the Permian. And the results are pretty remarkable. And they're sharing this with, with some of the uh, consulting firms to, uh, to build some confidence in, in the market and tap their horn because they do have quite an advantage as an integrated oil producer here in the U.S. And the result is 15 to 20 percent first year production uplift across what they're saying is 200 plus Permian wells to date. And that translates to roughly 42,000 barrels per day of incremental output from wells that they've completed in this period of time with this new propent. So the real leverage is, is not just in the engineering and in the production uplift, but ExxonMobil produces this petroleum coke 
at an internal um, cost that's only $20 a ton, whereas other independents are buying synthetic ceramic products at $500 to $1,000 per ton. So that's quite a benefit. The cost advantage compounds across hundreds of wells and across you know, decades of, of production that should come out of these wells into the future. So this is vertical integration in its purest form. It's, it's not agility or, you know, or, or marketing speak, but it's, it's hardcore. It's real. It's structural advantage. And other major independents just can't, they can't uh, use this as a headline in their hustle. But when the big boys like Exxon Mobil have already paid to build the refinery in infrastructure, They've got the pipeline and, and the, uh, the ability to, to create this prop. And, you know, it's an unfair advantage that they've, they've really got. And uh, they're using it quite well, hopefully to our advantage. Now, deep water drilling is following a, a similar trajectory, just with different equipment. And basically, there's a lot of super high pressure reservoirs beneath the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico that have been held back from being um, explored and exploited because they're like 20,000 PSI, you know, blowout preventers that are required and the pipe and technology that uh, is required to safely exploit these high pressure reservoirs in the Gulf you know, have, have, have just not been available, but it, it's becoming available now. And this new technology is opening up ultra high pressure reservoirs in the Gulf of Mexico that sat on these seismic surveys for years with nobody, you know, being capable of drilling them safely. And safety is the important thing here. Of course, we do have an administration that's probably more um, tolerant and the regulations have, have, uh, I think we just have a more friendly environment to operate in, in the Gulf of Mexico today. So there's less um, spectacular risk if something does go wrong. But I think they are operating to the best that I can tell with uh, a lot of care and, and attention to make sure that nobody gets hurt and that there's no spills. Keep your fingers crossed. But the break-even cost on the best projects run $20 to $35 per barrel with production decline rates that are a lot better or a lot more gentle than shale. Shale falls off very fast. And this offshore Gulf of Mexico high-pressure reservoirs decline very slowly. But these projects, you know, if, if only three... You know, just a few of these projects, you know, line up simultaneously, you know, there could be stable fiscal terms over the next 20 to 30 years with predictable regulation that doesn't shift with whoever's in Washington and a credible assumption that the future prices justify billions that are required for these Gulf of Mexico reservoirs to be brought online to fuel your cars and your lifestyle here in America and, and around the, and to enjoy all the benefits that you enjoy by having this energy independence uh, geopolitically in the world. So time will tell, but when even one of those elements, fr you know, fractures and falls apart, these projects stall. And regardless of how good the rocks look, policy and politics really do dictate what kind of supply comes out of some of these higher risk uh, reservoirs like those in the Gulf of Mexico. And even you could reach up into Alaska and say they kind of fall into that category where there's some environmental concerns that are potentially um, put on the table politically that affect long-term regulations. And those near-term huge investments that are required for those kinds of, of reserves. 
Now let's look at the M&A activity. Global upstream deal value dropped about a third in the first half of, of this year to roughly $80 billion. The mega Permian consolidations that define 2023 and 24 are mostly done. So what remains? Well, there's smaller roll-ups focused on inventory consolidation and cost reduction. Crescent buying Vital, Barry selling to California Resources, EOG positioning in the Utica. None of these are empire building moves, but they're survival plays wrapped in growth language. Assets encumbered by politics like Citco or Venezuelan claims trade at spreads that reflect legal delays and sanctions risk, not just commodity price swings. That spread is really the market's way of pricing how long legal teams will be billing by the hour. OPEC Plus finds itself in an increasingly constrained box. They've decided to hold back further production increases into early 2026, projecting a surplus into three to four million barrel day range. Saudi Arabia and a few others, they do hold spare capacity, but flooding the market, well, then Brent could get into the low 50s, which undercuts their own budgets. Meanwhile, non-OPEC supply keeps grinding higher. U.S., our domestic production here in the U.S. being stable around 13.6 to 8 million barrels per day. Then you've got Brazil, Guyana, Canada, Argentina, they're all adding projects that are adding up and creating a glut. The cartel has shifted from dictating terms to reacting. So it's interesting how, you know, they become more friendly investors here in the U.S. as their the control that they once held over the world economy and geopolitically has eroded with our energy independence as we've strengthened our fossil fuel um, tool chest, so to speak. And they're, they're, they're managing the slow erosion of their influence rather than choreographing a, a tight market. So U.S. sanctions on Rosneft and Luke Oil and Russia, well, they've taken a meaningful bite out of the Russian refining and export capacity. Indian and Chinese buyers haven't stopped taking those Russian barrels, but they have had to reroute deals, restructure around shipping, pay more insurance. There's lots of hands in the middle here and absorb some sanctions that, that uh, they have, have to take into account in their pricing. The same toolkit applies to Iran and Venezuela. It's not, a re, it's not resource geology anymore. It's power politics. We have plenty of of uh, resources in the ground. We know where they are. And a lot of them are out there. A lot of these resources are floating on the ocean today in tankers. So it's politics that decides which molecules move where and at what discount. Global exploration volumes have cratered from roughly 20 billion barrels of oil equivalent annually in the early 2010s to about five to six billion in recent years. I stated this recently, and I just wanted to repeat myself here today to make that point. Exploration is really falling off. Nonetheless, we have access to, to so much oil today that there's not really a lot of um, vulnerability in terms of, of supply meeting the demand. The discoveries that matter this year in 2025 might be Brill's, uh, Brazil's Santos Basin, Nambia's Orange Basin. Those probably do matter. But the real work is incremental. This technology, these shale 4.0 completions, the recompletions that are difficult to predict but are profound in their impact. The recovery factor improvements on existing infrastructure or existing reserves that are being produced, we're learning how to, how to get more out of the ground. That's worthwhile work. It's incremental. It doesn't change the fact that reservoirs do decline. Investments are needed to sustain production. 
And the infrastructure that's producing these older fields and reservoirs, well, it ages and falls apart. It could become more and more of an environmental concern with time. And a well-placed storm, well, that can knock, <laughs> knock you in the teeth if you're operating in the middle of one of those. Even if it's a well-run asset that's uh, even taken down before the storm hits. Now, artificial intelligence is still reshaping daily economics. Adnox field op optimization systems, uh, Schlumberger and Halliburton's play storm can knock well-run assets completely offline. Artificial intelligence is reshaping the daily economics. Adnox field optimization systems, Schlumberger and Halliburton's drilling platforms, BP's digital twins, Chevron's drone-based methane detection. They cut costs, reduce downtime, catch failures earlier. They help competent teams run fields better. But AI doesn't protect a project from sanctions or a pipeline from washout or a plant from grid failure. When a heat dome settles over a region, it's a force multiplier inside systems still bounded by geology, weather, and politics. Heading into 2026, this isn't a narrative about winners and losers in some kind of rah-rah inspirational sense. It's about operating at the intersection of several constraints, the rock, the weather, balance sheets and capital structures, and mostly the decisions of people in power who may or may not be familiar with what it actually takes to, to be running a, a sustained operation in upstream oil and gas. So oil faces some structural headwind from oversupply and softer demand. Gas has a, a lot more firm support from LNG and power demand but that support is still going to need some permitting and regulatory and policy, as well as the cooperation of multiple parties involved in the grid design. And that can change with an election or a policy shift. You know, a peace deal in Eastern Europe or an executive order in Washington, a new pipeline agreement with Canada, or a stalled storm in the Gulf can add or remove supply in a week. Um, that a lot of technology programs, you know, can't even offset in a year. So the narrative shifts every time industry interest and political power line up differently. Geology and nature enforce limits whether the industry acknowledges them or not. I'm Mark Roach, and this is FutureWise Energy. Know what your balance sheet can support. Stay awake about what regulators are actually doing. And remember that luck disguises itself as strategy until it stops. Have a good weekend.